Would you open us in prayer? I've got one. Okay. 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 Father God, we come to you this morning full of thanks. Full of thanks to you for all our blessing. Full of joy, Father, that we can meet with like-minded Christians. Full of praise for you that we have a lesson to look forward to as a class. And full of thanks that it can be recorded and so that everybody in our class can enjoy it and benefit from it. Pray, Father, to, to bless Tom. We thank you for Tom, who we call our teacher, but more than that, we call our friend. We thank you for his gifts to us. We thank you, Lord, for every member of this Faith Builders class, and we pray that you will turn your ear to them and hear their prayers today as, as they depend on you. Thank you, Lord, for, for what we learn from studying the Bible, and thank you for teachers willing to share with us. Accept our praise and our thanks, Lord, as we study together. Amen. Amen. We're going to look at something this morning that is very familiar. Uh, ever since uh, we were children in, uh, in church, we heard something called the Mizpah Benediction. Um, and uh, it was, May the Lord watch between me and thee, while we are absent one from the other. Very, I mean, it's very familiar. It's not something that is uh, uh, not known, but it is widely used. And in order for us to get to that, I want to look at the characters involved in order to understand exactly what it is that we're dealing with at Mizpah. It's good for us to know something about the characters who put it all together for us. So I'm going to start way back with Abraham and tell you that he started as Abram. And he started there in chapter 11, and he stays as Abram until chapter 17. So there's six chapters in Genesis that has the name Abram. And by name, he appears as Abram 30 times. Uh, his name means the father of nations. Now, when you look at the number of times that Abram appears as Abraham, he begins at chapter 17, and he goes all the way through 50. So he appears from 12 through 50, which is a total of 38 chapters. Now, Genesis is only 50 chapters long. Does that say something? I mean, what does that tell you about the importance of this character? He appears in 38 chapters of the whole book. What does that kind of tell you? What's the book interested in? Foundation. Is it, the book is interested in this man mm -hmm. and his progeny. Mm -hmm. So from, from 11 through 50, 38 chapters, we have about a 250-year history of one family. Genesis, as you probably remember or know, is the second largest book in the whole Bible. Jeremiah is the biggest book of the Bible. Genesis is the second largest book. And it shows us that this period and these characters are of great interest to the, the storyteller, the person who put this all down. Now, Isaac... Oh, by the way, uh, the total number of times that Abram is mentioned in the book as Abraham and, and Abram is 78 times. That's how many mentions Abram and Abraham get in the whole book. And it comes out to 35% of the coverage of these 20, 250 years. Isaac, by name, Isaac, 
has only 28 entries. That's the totality of the times that his name is mentioned. And he goes from 17 through 50 thir in 13 books. He's mentioned in only 13 of the chapters of Genesis. Uh, then we get to the name Jacob. Uh, by the way, he has 26% of all the chapters in Genesis. And then we get to Jacob. By name, by name, Jacob is mentioned 224 times in Genesis alone. In all of the other times that he is mentioned in the Bible, it comes to 28 other times. So 252 times Jacob is mentioned in this book of Genesis. And it comes out to 37% of all the mentions, and he appears in 19 chapters. So when you add 37, 26, and 35, you get 98% coverage in, in 38 chapters of the book. So it, just by looking at the characters involved, what we find is that over a period of 250 years, Abraham through Jacob, this family dominates the narrative, and the dominant figure is not Abraham, it surely is not Jacob, but it is Jacob, Yaakov. This character is the focus of the book in that family. And the reason we know it is just simply by the numbers. The numbers tell us what the writer is interested in. And he's really interested in this particular character. Now there's something about this family that I find to be absolutely stunning. Let's see if I can get some of this off as quickly as possible. What is there about that family that stands out in, in the narrative? What is it in that, in that whole narrative that stands out about the characters in this family? Well, let's look at Ava. He was primarily what? What was his occupation? He was a businessman. All right. He had dealings in several different lands, but he had dealings especially in... How do we know that? How, how do we know that Abraham had most of his dealings in Egypt? Well, the book tells us. Uh, when he went to uh, Egypt with his wife, what did Pharaoh think about Abraham's wife? Did he, did he like her? Did he hate her? What, did, what happened? He liked, he liked her. He liked her. How much did he like her? Enough to make a wife out of her. Yeah. And what did Abraham say about her? His sister. Yeah, this is my sister. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, this is not a savory character. This is somebody who's willing to lie uh, to the Pharaoh. Uh, who lies to the Pharaoh and lives? He lies to his wife. Lies to him. Well, no. He, but <laughs> well, what does that tell you about the position of women back then? It was, it was pitiful. Yeah, but I mean, what does it say? How much, how much say did they have in, in what happened to them? They were just Another property. That, that's right. That, they, they were expendable. And, uh, and even though we like to think that there was great love between all of these people, uh, and there probably was, but expediency is something that we need to consider. Now, what about Isaac? What about Isaac? 
What happened to Isaac that was so traumatic? His what? birthright was stolen. Well, that's later. But what happened to Isaac? Well, he was almost sacrificed. Exactly. His father had tied him to the pile of wood that was to be burned and, and was ready to kill him. What does that do to one's character development? <laughs> and what does it say about the kind of relationship he would have with, with his father and anyone else after that? What does that kind of tell you? That he was a very diminished character. And the number of times that he's mentioned in the book tells you how diminished he was. He was simply uh, the next step in getting to Yaakov, in getting to Jacob. His name means laughter, right? His na right. Yeah. It, the, the Yod at the beginning mm -hmm. is the third masculine singular, he. Mm -hmm. And Tzahak means to laugh. And so he was the child of laughter when, when Sarah was told that she was to have a baby at 90-some years old. She, she right. thought, you know, what a joke, right? Mm -hmm. so, so his name is He Laughs. Uh, and then we, get, then we get to the character Jacob. What can we say about Jacob? <laughs> what, with whom did he conspire? His mother. His mother, right? Mm -hmm. All right, his mother was Rebecca. And Rebecca was whose sister? Jacob. Laban. Laban was the son of Nahor. Nahor was Abraham's brother. We've got, we've got a, a real intertwined marriage of cousins and, and uh, kinfolk in this particular family. His mother, uh, Isaac, uh, or rather Jacob's mother, was, uh, was uh, Rachel. I, I mean Rebecca, excuse me. And she had twins, right? She had Esau who was the firstborn, and she had Jacob following. Now, what happened when it came time to divvy up the property? When, when Isaac, who was blind, what happened? Was it a straightforward pass to Esau? It should have been. It should have been, but what happened? He, Jacob stole his birthright. How did he do it? Who told him to do that? Rebecca. Exactly. Yeah. Rebecca is Laban's brother. All right, so what are we looking at here in this family? Abraham, who is part of that family, is a liar, is a user. Isaac is very diminished by, by the sacrifice. And then we get to Jacob with his 250-some mentions in 37% of, of the book. His mother said to him, look, I'll take care of this mess. You really ought to be the one who inherits. And I'm going to help you out. So she tells him to go and, and, uh, and get the kind of savory food that his father liked. What was that? Do you know? What part of the lamb leg did he like? There's a little muscle. Oh, yeah. Say it. You know it. It's the one they don't eat now. Is it? No, no, no. no. It was. It, it's the one that's the most tasty. It's part of. Oh. It's part of the leg. And so that little portion mm -hmm. was what was prepared, and it was given to Isaac. And Isaac said, "There's, there's, there's something that scans here. There's something that's not quite right. Mm -hmm. What was it that was not quite right?" He, what did he do? He, 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 felt, he felt Jacob. He wasn't hairy enough. <laughs> That's exactly right. Exactly right. Esau, it, it says many times, was a hairy man. 
And Jacob was a smooth man. So what did they conspire to do? They got some kind of a wig, <laughs> some kind of a, 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 an extra, and that's what Isaac rubbed. And he said, this feels like Esau, but he smells like Jacob. <laughs> and he blessed him anyhow. Now, what, what is a blessing? What is it just, you know, God bless you? No. A blessing was the way that family wealth was conferred, was transferred. And so Jacob was, was uh, swindled. He was hoodwinked. He was, he was uh, lied to. This, he thought he was dealing with Esau and passing the, the wealth. But that was not true. He gave it to Jacob. So the blessing was a verbal will. Yes, exactly. Exactly. They didn't have lawyers. Right. They didn't have instruments of, of uh, uh, legal documents. And so they did it. You know, their word was, was whatever it was. So Jacob gets it all. And he does it by stealth. He does it by craft. He does it by lying. So we're dealing now with a family of scamps. We're dealing with, a, it's in, in, the, in the book, it's called a trickster. And when they, when they talk about Laban, they call him Laban the Aramean. And the word Aramean translates out to trickster. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's such a wonderful story of these biblical characters who are flawed. It was in their genes. It's in their genetic makeup. They can't help themselves but do that kind of activity. It's who they are. When you look at the biblical characters, almost all of them are flawed in some way or another. I'll get back to this later. What was the sin of Moses? He was a murderer. Yeah. He was a murderer. Yeah, Moses was a murderer. And yet, what happens? The book writes him out as what? Really good guy. And it's something that we need to keep in the back of our mind as we go through this today. We are dealing with a family who has a long history of bad behavior, uh, a behavior that we would not want to have in our own heritage. And yet, you know, when we look back, we probably got a horse thief back there someplace. Mm -hmm. I, I'm sure that in my family, there had to be at least one horse thief. You know? So, do you, do you have any questions about what we're looking at so far? Well, I have an observation. Go ahead. Does that mean that they were a usual family of the day? I mean, were all families like that? I, I don't know how to answer that. I just know that the writers chose this one for a reason. And, and what that reason is, I'm hopeful to be able to put it up on the board and, and we'll look at it uh, this morning. Um, I don't think that all families were like that. I mean, in our, in our society, what do we have, 1% are criminals? Uh, I don't know. I, I, no, I, th I think that that's the number, that 1% of our, our population are, are criminals. Which means that 99% of us are not. Which is pretty good, you know? I mean, when you think about it, if only 1% of our people are, are prisoners and, and that kind of you know, 99% of us are not. They, okay. they, they, left, they lived on the trade route, right? From like Babylon down and then around to Damascus and then down yeah. to Egypt. And that's where Bedouins live now. I wonder, are they the same from the same old tribe? Because I don't know how to answer that. I, you I'm need sure. to trade in this desert, you have to be wily. Because yeah. you could lose your head, you know, yeah. <laughs> or whatever. Yeah. 
So maybe that was part of it, you know, and they admired people who were smart. Yeah, that, that's, a, that's a really good observation. Yeah. Uh, whether it's still like that, I'm sure that that has got to be, you know, bred down some. And uh, maybe there are different ways. Mm -hmm. I mean, there were no cyber crimes back then. Why? Because they didn't have it. They didn't have this kind of stuff back then. And had they had it, I'm sure they would have used it. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, it's just, it's just that way. All right. I want to move now, knowing who these, who these characters are. I haven't done anything with Laban yet, but I'll get to him. I want you to turn in your books to chapter 31. You want a book, Seth? Huh? Hey, can you just I've got mine. Here, here's one. Oh. We're looking at chapter 31 in Genesis. Y'all have 31 handy? All right, Nancy, would you begin reading for me, please, at verse 1 and stop at 16, but I'll probably stop you in between, okay? So okay. don't worry about that. Go ahead. Okay. Now Jacob heard that the sons of Laban were saying, Jacob has taken all that was our father's. He has gained all this wealth from what belonged to our father. Okay, look at that now. Yeah. What, what's the accusation here? That he stole. He's a thief. Well. He stole all this. I mean, that's the first thing that, he, that the sons are saying. This guy's a thief. Look what he's stolen. Okay, continue. And Jacob saw that Laban did not regard him as favorably as he did before. Then the Lord said to Jacob, Return to the land of your ancestors and to your kindred, and I will be with you. Isn't that interesting? The yes. Lord said to him. Yeah. Now, how does this happen? Does, does uh, an angel of the Lord come down and speak in his ear? Does God speak directly to him? Or is this a conscious uh, uh, thought in his head that God is asking me now to get out of here? I've, I've, I've been in this mess for a long time. And I can say that God has told me to do this. Okay, continue, Nancy. Uh, At four. So Jacob sent and called Rachel and Leah into the field for his wife. Who, who are Rachel and Leah? His wives. Okay. And said to them, I see that your father does not regard me as favorably as he did before, but the God of my father has been with me. You know that I have served your father with all my strength, Yet your father has cheated All right, so here's a counter. Here's a counter indictment. That I'm called a thief, but your father is a cheat. He's cheated me. Go ahead, continue. And he changed my wages ten times. <laughs> and he has cheated me and changed my wages ten times, but God did not permit him to harm me. He said, the speckled, I guess the sheep, right? Yeah. Shall be your wages, then all of the flock bore speckled. See, isn't that interesting? Uh, uh, Laban says, okay, you can have the speckled spotted ones. And what happened? I'm a, it's a miracle. <laughs> All the sheep were sp spotted and speckled. Maybe he was out when his paint broke. <laughs> <laughs> you, you can't put it past them, can you? That's right. Okay, go ahead, Nancy. Then all the flock bore, if he said, the striped shall be your wages, then all the flock bore striped. Thus God has taken away the livestock of your father. I didn't do it. <laughs> huh? I didn't do it. It was God who did it. And, and has given them to me. Yeah. <laughs> go ahead. During the mating of the flock, I once had a dream in which I looked up and saw that the male goats that leaped upon the flock were striped, speckled, and mottled. Then the angel of God said to me in the dream, Jacob, 
And I said, here I am. <laughs> and he said, look up and see that all the goats that leap on the flock are striped, speckled, and mottled. For I have seen all that Laban is doing to you. I am the God of Bethel, where you anointed a pillar and made a vow to me. Now leave this land at once and return to the land of your birth. Continue. Then Re Rachel and Leah answered him, is there any portion or inheritance left to us in our father's house? <laughs> Are we not regarded by him as foreigners? For he has sold us. Isn't that interesting? Huh? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, what's our worth? Um, I mean, do we have any value? Do we have any rights? Yeah. Do we have anything that's ours? Yeah, and on. the answer is? And he has been using up the money given. <laughs> <laughs> this is quite a character, this Laban, isn't he? Yeah. All the property that God has taken away from our father belongs to us and to our children. Now then, do whatever God has said to you. <laughs> All right. A little so, friction in the family. A little family yeah. friction. Yeah. That's exactly right. All right. Go on. No, no. Let's, let's change voices at this point. Uh, Jacob is the wrong party here. And clearly, according to Jacob... Laban is the one who's doing the wronging. Huh? And that's, that's, that's his side of the story. So, uh, Jacob's answer then to Laban is in 31 at 38. Uh, uh, Mary Lou, would you read uh, chapter 31 starting at verse 38 through 42? Okay. Then Jacob became angry and berated Laban. Jacob said to Laban, what is my, uh, what is my no, offense? No, where are you, Mary Lou? Oh, chapter 31. At verse 38. Uh-huh. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, go ahead. Then Jacob became angry and berated Laban. Jacob said to Laban, what is my offense? What is my sin that you have hotly pursued me? For you have felt through all my goods. What have you found in all your household, in all your household goods? Set it here before my kinsmen and your kinsmen, that they may decide between us two. These twenty years I have been with you. Your ewes and your female goats have not miscarried. I have not eaten the rams of your flocks. What was torn by wild beasts I did not bring to you. I bore the loss of it myself. From my hand you required it, whether stolen by day or stolen by night. There I was. By day the heat consumed me and the cold by night, and my sleep fled from my eyes. These twenty years I have been in your house. I served you fourteen years for your two daughters, and six years for your flock, and you have changed my wages ten times. If the God of my father, the God of Abraham, and the fear of Isaac had not been on my side, surely now you would have sent me away empty-handed. God saw my affliction and the labor of my hands and rebuked you last night. So what, what is it that uh, Jacob is doing? What is he saying to Laban in this, uh, in this section? He's just laying out the reason. He says, you're a terrible person. To go, yeah. <laughs> I mean, you really have got to look at what you've done to me over 20 years. This isn't just something that happened recently. You've been doing this for 20 years to me. Does Laban have a defense? He does not. He does not. Let's see what he says. Bob, would you read starting at 43, please, and going through 50? Then Laban answered and said to Jacob, The daughters are my daughters. <laughs> the children... you know, see, it, it just went over his head, didn't it? What you said doesn't count. <laughs> Look at what I am saying to you. Those two women that are your wives, they're mine. Yeah. Go ahead. The daughters are my daughters, the children are my children, <laughs> the flocks are my flocks, and all you see is mine. Mine, mine, I own it all. It's mine, it's not yours. It doesn't matter you worked 20 years for me. I paid you a little bit. You're not worth anything more than just being a hired servant. Go ahead. But what can I do today about these daughters of mine or about, or about their children whom they have born? 
Come now. Let us make a covenant, you and I. Isn't that interesting? Huh? Look at this word. A covenant. Huh? A covenant. This is not a benediction. We have turned it and called it the Mizpah benediction. But Jacob is calling for a covenant. It's called Berit. A covenant like, like it, is, it is more than agreement. Because covenants, what happens to a covenant? Isn't Laban the one who calls for the covenant? Laban is calling for a covenant. Isn't that interesting? Because the word is karat. Covenants are... They, they, it wasn't written down, was it? I mean, they didn't have, they didn't have a, a legal document that they both could sign. A covenant, and, and, and this is the word that's in the Hebrew text, is karat. They cut a covenant. Now how do you cut a covenant? Is it, is it with mutual blood? What don't you sacrifice them? Alright, here's, here's a, here are two stands. Alright? And you cut a sheep or a goat or a cow, a beef. You cut it in half and you hang that animal in between these two pillars. And what you say to make a covenant is, may the Lord do this to me and more if I fail to keep my end of the agreement. Wow. <laughs> Who is asking for a covenant to be cut? Is Jacob asking for it? Laban is asking. Why? Why not Jacob? Because Jacob is the wronged party. And Laban is the one who did the wronging. And it finally got through to him. It finally got through to Laban that, my goodness, I really have been a terrible person to this man. I really have been unfair. It's true what he said. Whenever there was a loss, he bore it. Whenever he had to stay up all night with a sheep, he did it, not me. Maybe he was saying, I'll push him to the brink. I better not do anything else. That's a possibility. I've never considered that. But that's an absolute possibility. That he's doing it out of self-preservation. <laughs> because what does Laban and others know about revenge? It's forever. I mean, look at, look at even today in Palestine. The Gaza Strip. Israel. The West Bank. What is it that they are doing? They're still, they're still fighting each other over a little piece of dirt. And it will go on for another millennia or more. There is not a solution because they hate each other. You know, what you did to my great-grandfather, <laughs> boy, it's like the Serbs and the Croats. They hate each other. They've been hating each other for generations, and they'll continue to hate each other. So, what is it that Laban is asking? He's asking for Jacob not to retaliate. Because he knows, he knows it's in there. When, when Jacob finally gets free and is about to meet his brother Esau, what is in Jacob's mind? The wrong he did again. Boy, am I in trouble. <laughs> you know, Esau, Esau's going to kind of come to me with everything he's got. So this revenge kind of mentality 
is something that has been in existence in this particular family for a very, very long time. The, the characters are, are unsavory. They are untrustworthy. They are not uh, on the level. They will do anything to get an advantage. And it's that kind of mentality that we address in, in, uh, in the life of the church. We try to ameliorate that urge on our part uh, to do those kinds of things, even though we want to. Even today we have families that don't speak to each other. Exactly. Tell, say more. Do you know some? Uh, yes, I do, but I'm not going to name them. <laughs> <laughs> okay, 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 but but I mean, it still it happens. Doesn't happen to be my thing. Yeah. That's right. That's right. Okay. Uh, Tom, would yes. you say a little bit more about the actual? Was it like a ceremony when yes. they cut the animal? And yes. Like a sacred ceremony. It was. And when you and, and you they stretched it out and then they cut it. Was they would they would slaughter an animal and uh -huh. they would they would cut it in half. Uh -huh. and they would hang half of, of the animal on this side and half on that side. And they would stand in between those two halves of the slaughtered animal. And they would say the formula, May God do this to me and more if I fail to keep my end of the agreement. Uh, so then they had cut a deal. They like, cut a deal. Like we say... I mean, you can hear that even in business world. Some of the finally cut a deal, so that's where that started. That's where it comes from. Amazing. Yeah. It is amazing. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. The, the book is so alive with with identifying who we are. Yes. I mean, we haven't changed uh, in all the years. Humanity has not changed in all the years. I mean, we still have murderers. We still steal from each other. We still yes. covet. We still uh, do adultery. Uh, we, there, there are families who hate each other. Uh, I mean, we have not changed. What's changed is the technology that's, that surrounds us. We just do it more efficiently now. Well, Isn't that right, Seth? Very much true. But don't you think there's, um, that there's more of the, the law, you know, in Jesus? They know, people know it's wrong. They don't care. They don't yeah. care. Yeah. But at least they know. Yeah, they, they, they don't care. They didn't have any, like, yeah. you know. Well, it doesn't matter what the church says. Right. It doesn't right. matter what the synagogue says. It doesn't matter what the mosque says. Right. People are going to do what they're going to do, regardless. Right. But the, 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 the task of the church is to change the minds and the hearts. So that that kind of behavior doesn't happen. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's that's what we hope for. That's what we encourage yeah. people to do. Yeah. We encourage people not to need this kind of ceremony to be good to each other. Yeah. So when God looks down and says, "Look at all these sinners," He's talking about this kind of thing. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. And, and uh, idol worship and stuff like that. I mean, that's a part of it. Ooh. You know, we all worship something or someone, somehow. And what the church tries to do is to direct that worship into uh, some kind of, uh, of a behavior that is beneficial and godlike. And that's why Jesus was so dramatic. <laughs> our, our, our need... Yeah. Yeah. Our need is, is to be upright. Right. That's, that's, we need to be upright. Mm -hmm. We don't need... If I, you know, I should, have, I should have thought about this before I came. I should have brought the last letter that I received from a man in prison. Um, he's in for life. He did two murders. And uh, he's, he flails. He flails around. Uh, he, wants, he wants not to hurt people anymore, but he doesn't know how to stop. Yeah. And I should have brought his last letter. Uh, maybe next time I, I come, I'll, I'll remember to bring it. 
But in it, he is, he is begging me to help him uh, stop uh, the, the pattern that he has fallen into his whole life. And uh, all I can tell him is what I know about changing one's life. You know, how, how was it that I had to change? What was it about me that I had to change in order to be a, a good person? What was it? And so I, I, try to, I try to tell him along those lines. Um, here, in this particular story, what we find is that Laban, the one who does the wronging for 20 years, finally realizes that he has been a terrible person. He has, he has, he has done things that are, are not right. And in order, I, I want to attribute something good to Laban. But I think it was self-preservation. <laughs> that, that Laban did not want Jacob to come back and, and uh, seek revenge. It seems like the blood of the covenant did cause him to be faithful to that promise. Well, that's, exa that's so, exactly right. right. He did not want this to happen. And right. the belief was, the belief was that God, God will do to Laban what Laban and Jacob did to that sheep. Right. It's an object lesson, too. And I think like Jesus' crucifixion, people, some people say, oh, gross, and it's so violent. But... Yes, you have to see that to identify with it. I think, you know, like like Moses said, hold it high, like the, the, the scepter in, the, in Exodus, how he, you know, he's, he said, I'd be lifted up. I don't know. So I'll be. Uh, is there any way, is there any way that, that, this problem that they have, is there any way that they can fix it without blood? And the answer is what Nancy was talking about, that blood was shed in order for order to be reestablished and for the two families. And these now are two separate or becoming separate families are going to be able to live in peace. There was no, there was no court there were no attorneys, there were no legal instruments that could be drawn up and signed, but this was fixed in their mind, and this served for the remainder of their time. Now, so the way we use the, that as a benediction is just sweet, but it's not what it was meant. When it was originally said. Yeah, and, and it's not called a benediction. It's called right. a covenant. Yeah. Yeah, but we, but we we're going to get some benefit out of it, and I'm hoping I'm hoping to show some of those benefits uh, soon. Okay. We'll, I'm still on the way okay. to getting there, but, but soon we we'll, we'll get there. Um, now, Bob, you did not read. Um, yeah, here. Read 46, please. Tap, er, uh, verse number 46 in 31. You mean it goes that long? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. 46. Yeah. This is after Laban says, let's make a covenant. And, and it says at 46. Okay. Go ahead. And Jacob said to his kinfolk, gather stone. And they took stones and made a heap, and they ate there by the heap. Yeah, okay. Now, they didn't throw this away. All right? They didn't throw the barbecue away. They ate it. What does that do? When you eat the flesh of the sacrificial animal, what was the belief? You took it to heart. You took it, you internalized it? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And you benefited from it. Mm -hmm. All right? You benefited from the sacrifice. 
Take and eat this, all of you. Drink this cup. There are roots in our theology, and they go back a long way. All right, so Laban calls for a covenant. Jacob agrees to it. And uh, at 48, Bob, Laban said now, after they ate, Thank you for skipping 47, because I couldn't pronounce That's all right. <laughs> That's all right. That's all right. It wasn't. Laban said, This heap is a witness between you and me. Therefore he called it Galid, and the pillar Mitzvah. And he said, The Lord watched between you and me when we are absent from one another. If you ill-treat my daughters, if you take wives in addition to my daughters, though no one else, no one else with us, is with us, remember that God is witness between you and me. Okay, now who's the speaker here? Is well, it Jacob Laban. or Laban? It's Laban! Yeah. Yeah. So. He said, this is what you do or else. Yes! <laughs> I mean, it's a wonderful narrative, isn't it? Yes, it is. I mean, it's just absolutely uh, uh, stunning. The, the character change that has come over this fellow, whether it is heartfelt or whether it is something that is um, uh, self-serving, it doesn't matter. The effect is the same. The result is exactly the same. That he is trying to prevent ill feelings and retaliation to come from Jacob back on him. And he is very grateful now. May the Lord, <laughs> may the Lord watch between the two of us, so that nothing ill comes to me. And I promise that no ill will go to you. How good is that? I mean, how good is that? That we are, that the two men are now willing the good of the other. How good is that? I mean, isn't that something that we do in, in the church, and especially now, while we are absent one from the other, we will the good of all of the people. In, in the last email that Cassie sent, at the bottom of it, she says, I'm praying for you. Yes. Huh? How good is that? Wonderful. Every time Mary Lou sends out... Uh, uh, an email. What what is it that she says that we're praying for, and and she puts names in it even. You know how good is that? We're willing the good of each other, and it's something that comes out of this kind of of thinking. So what we have done is we have taken something that was not good, and we've turned it into something that's wonderful. I mean that's that's conversion. Yes. That's, that's something that, that we all know about, and, and it's something that serves us well. It started here. And, uh, and they lived happily ever after. And, and they did. And they did. Exactly right. They did. They benefited from something like this. Uh, that what they're saying is that... that if, if we turn over, if we turn over our bad behavior, our ill thoughts, our intentions of, of, of bad, if we turn all of that over to God and, and give it to God, then what happens? We don't own it anymore. We don't have to do it anymore. What, what, a, what a wonderful way to live. If we turn over to God, that which is wrong, that which is ill-intended toward our fellows, if we turn over to God and give to God those, those terrible deeds that we fantasize in our head, we don't own it anymore. It can drop from us, and we can live a, a, a productive life. 
That's what it is that we are wishing upon each other while we are absent one from the other. May God stand between the two of us. Take any ill will that we have between us. Take any kind of hurt that we have done to each other and, and, and uh, not own it any longer. What does God do with it? God forgives it. God heals it. God amends it. And, and, and returns us then to a better way of life. This has been a ministry of First Presbyterian Church of Marietta, Georgia. Join us as together we change lives with faith, hope, and love. For more information, go to fpcmarietta.org. Thank you and have a blessed day.